Welcome. This session is being recorded. The recording will be posted to YouTube and a link will be sent out to participants to view the recording uh, when it becomes available. This session is on how to do a successful literature review. And my name is Paul Levette. I'm one of the reference librarians at the Himmelfarb Health Sciences Library. I've tried to break this down into um, a series of steps. And so I'm going to have a slide set but I will be jumping around between documents. There is a handout for this session uh, with additional readings, and that handout uh, can be accessed um, through a link on uh, the chat box. If you are in this session, or if you are viewing this video at a later point, uh, feel free to contact me. I'm going to share my session. So the first step would be to consider why are you doing your literature review? And there can be several reasons for this. And you could be doing it for course credit. Um, it could be that you are attending a professional society meeting and you've been asked to chair a guideline committee. Or it could be that you have been tasked by a co-investigator to carry out a literature review before you apply for a, a grant. Uh, what answer you give really determines what type of review you wish to carry out. Most literature reviews for course credit are going to be narrative reviews and um, mainly descriptive. Um, the analytical reviews are ones that you might be doing if you are in a clinical setting and you are asked to compare one type of intervention against another and you want to find all the studies that have been done on a topic. And if you are able to do that type of more focused um, review answering a specific clinical problem question, then you may be doing a systematic review. For a type of review that you might do for a grant application or for a dissertation or a thesis, you might well be doing a scoping review. And that's where you're trying to identify what the literature is out there on that topic. And so the intent behind the review that you wish to perform will um, also determine how you carry out your literature review. The other thing that you want to do at this point would be to identify what resources you need. What's your time frame? If it's for course credit, you may be expected to produce something within, say, six to 10 weeks. Um, that actually is a reasonable time frame in which to carry out a narrative literature review. And um, if you wish to do a systematic review and you are trying to identify everything that's been written about a topic, then obviously that's going to take uh, considerably longer. You may wish to involve other co-investigators with this review process, um, particularly if you wish to have a second opinion or to resolve um, any uh, questions that you might have about whether to include a paper or not. And if you wish you will need to uh, determine what access you have to journals and to the library databases that you'll be using for, for your search. Um, the next step is to consider what are you looking for. So this is where you want to begin by reading articles about the topic, carry out a, a, a rapid review to just initially get an idea about what's out there, what are the main themes that are being talked about, uh, what's been tried, what's been shown to succeed, are there any gaps, that kind of thing. Um, but once you start reading more about the topic, then you'll start go, you will start to notice that certain terms, certain measures, certain metrics, certain interventions will be coming up again and again in different settings perhaps, but uh, hopefully on like populations. And uh, from those uh, common themes, you can perhaps begin to write a short list of inclusion or exclusion criteria. This can be very short just three or four items. Uh, but you do need to have this in order to be able to uh, rule in or rule out papers that you wish to include in your review. And um, so to give an example of this, uh, I was involved on a literature review last year with a hematologist. And we were looking at pediatric patients with sickle cell disease. So our inclusion criteria 
included that the study population must have been a pediatric population, not an adult one, and uh, that they must have had the sickled cell blood cell type and not adult hemoglobin, adult hemoglobin or fetal hemoglobin. Um, and then the next thing you wish to do at this point as well is think about what types of study might best answer your question. And by that I mean, uh, are you going to be looking primarily for randomized trials? Or is this something that it's, for ethical reasons perhaps, it's impossible to randomize the study population? So maybe you'd be looking for, say, cohort studies and observational studies that follow uh, a group of patients over time. And so that can help determine uh, what you wish to review as well. Where should you look? This is the way you wish to select databases that index your subject area. Now, your choice of databases uh, can be guided by reading other reviews that have already been done on the topic. Most databases have some sort of review article type limiter that lets you uh, find those sorts of overview articles that have already been written. Other reviews are very helpful for suggesting uh, search keywords as well. Uh, as well as other databases uh, to search with. Um, but you could also go to our library website as well, which I'll go out to now. We have a series of research guides um, that you can uh, browse. The popular ones show up under here, or you can browse by school. So for instance, if I go to the School of Public Health, and here are our research guides. They generally jibe with the departmental structure. So if you were doing, say, a, a literature review that's looking at the Affordable Care Act and you were in the health policy department, you could look in this. And what you're looking for is the database list. So some of the databases that you might wish to search in your subject area. So for our Affordable Care Act example, you might want to look at Health Policy Reference Center. There are also um, three databases that you really ought to be searching every time regardless of your subject area. And these are um, listed on the research guide that I have on systematic reviews. You'll see that this guide has various tabs at the top, one of which is medical literature databases to search. And so um, the AHRQ, the UK Center for Reviews and Dissemination, and the International Cochrane Collaboration all recommend at a minimum that you need to be searching Medline, Embase, and the Cochrane Central Trials Register. Here at Hemelfarb, you can access Medline in either of its flavors, uh, Ovid Medline or PubMed. I personally prefer PubMed. Uh, the content of Embase is included in the Scopus database. So if you are searching Scopus, you're also searching uh, Embase as well. And then the Cochrane Central Trials Register is uh, another good place to go. Obviously, these are not the only ones, and so this uh, tab on my guide also recommends some other resources that you wish, may wish to look at for, say, sources of dissertations and theses, gray literature resources, um, and other clinical trial registers as well. Right? Clinicaltrials.gov is particularly useful. The uh, next step would be how would you carry out your search? This is where you need to identify your search keywords. And so this is something that, as I say, you can generally uh, do by um, reading around the topic, reading existing review articles that have already been published out there. But uh, you may also wish to uh, identify search terms that are specific to the databases that you're trying to search. And so um, let's just go out and have a look at an example of that. So let's say we wanted to do a search on uh, PubMed, because I'm trying to get into this from off campus. It's uh, prompting me to log in, which would happen with you too. And uh, as you're probably aware, there's uh, lots of ways to search PubMed. It's very keyword friendly. Um, but uh, another way of searching PubMed is uh, using these um, mesh links. And you can do a search on, let's say, smoking cessation. 
and uh, just check the box over here, add to search builder, and then carry out your search of PubMed. And obviously there are a very lot of articles that are out there already. Um, these are just sorted in the date in which they were indexed in uh, the database. So um, it's a fairly undifferentiated list. So you may wish to use some of these filters that we have here uh, for systematic reviews or reviews in order just to focus on those review articles. And it'll cut down the number that you get. One, one thing that is particularly helpful with um, PubMed in identifying other keywords and other uh, index headings is that um, if you go into the, uh, the article record in PubMed, in general, if you scroll down the page, you'll see this section that's marked publication types and mesh terms. If you click that, you can see how the article was indexed. And then if you click that uh, itself, you can then tell it to, I want you to search uh, PubMed for articles that are indexed in that fashion. Something else that's helpful about PubMed as well is every record has this link underneath it that says similar articles. So if you identify an article that you can see is on point and you'd like more like this, but this is just a vast number to have to go through, just try clicking that similar articles link. And it just brings up a short list of no more than 100 or so articles that uh, are indexed very similarly to your reference article that's the one at the top. And so that can be a very um, effective way to narrow down uh, a search. So that's what I mean by uh, thinking about those uh, headings. Document how you liter do your literature search. This is very important because you will likely want to return to your search at some point. And so you want to see how you did that. And uh, it'll also become helpful if you're planning to write this up for publication as well. So um, I'm going to go to an example spreadsheet that I wish to share with you, which was a spreadsheet that um, I put together for the literature search that I was doing with this hematologist last year on sickle cell pediatric patients. And so it's very simple. We just had a separate tab for each database that we'd searched. So we did our search in PubMed, Scopus, which covered the Embase content, the Cochrane Central Trials Register, and then clinicaltrials.gov was the fourth database we chose. And we have the keywords that we used to search and the number of results that we found uh, and the number of results that we then chose to export to RefWorks. Uh, fifth tab along, uh, the reason we chose RefWorks to manage and organize our citations is because it allows, RefWorks enables you to remove duplicate citations. If you are searching across more than one database, you are very likely to bring up duplicates. And so rather than having to trawl through a lot of um, uh, noise uh, before you even begin uh, carrying out your screening, uh, it's a good idea to remove duplicates and then also just write down how many you chose to remove. Uh, our final tab on this spreadsheet that we use to document our literature search, um, it simply, we needed some way to determine whether, how we arrived at whether what papers we chose to review. So of those 590 odd documents, we chose to um, put each citation um, it was given its own row. The first column is uh, an identifying number where we could get back to that paper if we had to. We chose to use the PMID number, uh, which is a, a number that's assigned to every record in PubMed. So this is an exclusive number for each record. You could literally copy and paste this number into PubMed and it'll bring that paper back up. And on this tab, uh, if I scroll down, you'll see that um, uh, we've got all 591 papers listed here. So the second column on this uh, spreadsheet uh, tab uh, was uh, the decision we made whether or not to include it in the review. Uh, but I'm getting ahead of myself, so let me go back to my slides. 
What do I do with my search results? Um, so you've done your searches on multiple databases. Uh, it's a good idea as you go along to create accounts in them to save the searches. Uh, it, it does it does help in order to, if, especially if you're trying to fit this in around your normal daily activities. If you've been working in front of a computer for a couple of hours and you need to go away, uh, it's a very good idea to uh, save the search so that you don't completely lose it. Um, and then, uh, as I say, record how many um, citations that you find. So the screening process is where you want to just read the title and abstract um, with your inclusion and exclusion criteria in mind. And on that first pass of the screening, you'll be surprised at how many you can actually get through. So of these 591 papers for our literature search, um, Basically, everything above the 95th row upwards was what we chose to re review after just reading the title and abstract. Everything from 96 down to 591, we, we decided to exclude. We didn't want to review. So that's about 80% of what you found. You could just rule out just by reading the title and abstract. And uh, what we did was in this third column, uh, we just gave a brief reason why we chose to exclude it. And so um, uh, that was the first pass of screening. Then you want to uh, perhaps go to a, a, the next level where you want to read the full text. So you're not reading the full text of those 590 articles, just those 94 that after having read the title and abstract, you've thought are candidate articles to review. And you just ask the same question again, should I still review this article? And so um, we looked at the full text. And uh, after having read the articles, we, we changed our minds for some of them. And I needed some way to uh, show that on this spreadsheet. So I simply highlighted the articles in yellow where um, we'd initially thought they were a candidate article, but on reading the full text, we chose to rule them out. Uh, we changed the decision to end, but it's also very clear um, that these are ones that we chose not to review. Uh, and again, we just gave a brief reason why. So having cut down from 590 articles, we ended up with about 54 of them. Um, we wish to... Um, compare the articles one against the other. And you can do that if you um, create some sort of data extraction form with the things that you want to compare between studies. And this can be um, a fairly straightforward uh, document that just has the, uh, the items that you wish to, uh, to compare with each other. So one way of doing that, if I can bring up an example of uh, my a data extraction form, uh, essentially one that's linked from a systematic review guide. So here's an example. Um, it's very straightforward. This was one that I did with an emergency department position. We were measuring interventions to increase uh, throughput through the emergency department. And so the things that this doctor would wanted to compare between articles were the type of setting, uh, where it was located, the sample size, the annual visit volume. These were all um, metrics and measures that mattered to his readers and to him. And so obviously these are going to vary. Uh, but again, he considered you know the study design type as well. He was interested in the intervention and the main outcome measures. So the idea is that you would print one of these forms for each paper that you were reading the full text and basically just uh, pull out the data and, and put it on there. And uh, once you have that data, then you can, um, well, we'll see, but you'll see that you'll, you'll be able to very easily create a, a table of study characteristics. Um, and that table will just have a, a row for each study and columns with each of these um, uh, metrics and then the numbers just from these sheets will go in the columns. So we'll have a look at an example of that in a bit. 
Uh, and optionally, you may wish to rank the quality of the studies you review. This is a necessary step if you were to carry out a systematic review. Um, but for most narrative literature reviews, it's not necessary. And uh, indeed, as we'll see in the, a published example we'll have a short look at shortly, um, there are other things that you may wish that are perhaps more important for your literature review to bring to the reader's attention than the quality of the study. So this is uh, the point where I uh, sh uh, show you an example of this. Um, but uh, uh, the, what I'm trying to illustrate is that using these tables, there's a way to um, save the time of the reader. Instead of having that reader have to trawl through all you know, 54 studies, how can you summarize the data? And one way is to take a, um, a flow diagram that's used in the PRISMA methodology for systematic reviews and enumerate it with the numbers that you've documented from your literature search. Uh, and then, as I say, draw up a table of study characteristics. Um, if you are doing a systematic review um, because you have a very clinically focused question, then it might be possible for you to do a statistical meta-analysis. But again, this is purely optional and not something that you need to do. It really just depends on the type of review that you wish to do. So uh, with that said, let's see if we can uh, see an example of this. So. This has uh, just been published online, this paper uh, that the hematologists and I um, did the literature search for. And so this is an example here of that Prisma flow diagram. So each box along the top row was for each of the four databases. And you see the numbers of records that we found. Our first pass screening is listed on this second level down. And um, after we removed duplicates, we, started, we, we had you know, 593. <laughs> Uh, individual articles. Of those, we uh, excluded 499 of them, and here are the reasons. So this is just summary data from that uh, tab that uh, you had the abstract review tab on your spreadsheet. Uh, after that first pass screening, this uh, third level here um, is uh, the process of the second level screening. So we assessed 94 of them by reading the full text. and. Uh, those ones that were highlighted in yellow added up to 40. So that's the number that goes here. We excluded another 40 of them. And uh, again, just summarize the reasons why that was the case. So on this bottom line, you have the actual number of articles in your literature review. And you can see at a glance, this is a very uh, smooth way to um, uh, ex explain to your readers how you did your literature search. And then here's an example of the uh, here's an example of the table of study characteristics. So remember, I talked about that data extraction form. So as I say, each of these rows is a separate study that we reviewed. And each of these columns was uh, some data that we wish to compare between studies. So uh, sample size, for instance, is one of the columns. And so <clears throat> it's very easy to see from this uh, at a glance. Uh, what sample sizes were included in the different papers that were included in our review. And uh, I mentioned, you know, you could use some sort of quality grading criteria to uh, evaluate the quality of the study. Um, the physician in this case chose instead that it was more important for the reader to uh, highlight the, um, the study era in which the study was carried out. And so that's what she's decided to put on this uh, instead. And she's defined here um, uh, the era being um, uh, whether it was before penicillin prophylaxis became available uh, for patients you know, with sickle cell disease, uh, or whether it was before universal newborn screening was performed, or, or so on and so forth. And so um, that's nice, again, because it's very easy to have a look at that and see, OK, this is when this study was done. And uh, you could do that instead of doing uh, quality criteria. If you did decide to, then um, I would uh, advise going to um, my systematic review guide, which uh, has a tab listing um, some of the review criteria that are out there. Some of them are very simple. Um, grade is probably the simplest. It just has two levels, strong, or weak uh, evidence. 
Um, but you can use a, a number score like Haddad. Uh, and if you wanted to rank results, then you could use something like that. Uh, some of these grading criteria is uh, um, uh, specific to a particular subject area. So the navigation guide is a, a grading criteria that's specific to reviews of environmental health or toxicology studies. So it might be worth having a look at one of those. And uh, somebody asked the question, um, can you get hold of the PRISMA uh, criteria for doing a systematic review? And uh, yes, it's possible to do that. Um, it's, uh, it's, a, it's, it's something that's published. And so if you go to my systematic review uh, guide, this guide was written with the attempt to explain the PRISMA criteria. And so uh, not only do I reference the, uh, the actual PRISMA paper itself, uh, but uh, I also uh, link out to the, um, the PRISMA checklist, which is a 27 item checklist. It's very straightforward. And there's a column at the end. And you can just record on uh, where in your document you have um, carried out this step. Uh, and once you fill them all in, you've done that. And uh, also a link as well to some existing reviews that have followed the Prisma format. Um, because uh, I strongly believe in not reinventing the wheel. And if there's an existing review out there that uh, is a, been done on your topic, I don't think that there's anything wrong in repeating that literature search yourself and uh, just updating it. In fact, that's a necessary step if you're doing uh, a review for a guideline, because you'd like to see what's been done on the topic before, uh, since the guideline was published, for instance, if you're doing an update. And uh, the final step, really, in the literature review process is just writing your paper. And uh, if you've used RefWorks to deduplicate your citations, then why not carry on the whole hog and use the write and cite function to uh, insert the in-text citations and generate your reference list? The nice thing about RefWorks is uh, it's free to use while you're here at GW. Um, you can export the data very easily to other bibliographic applications. So if you have a co-investigator who is using EndNote instead, you could just send them the RefWorks file and they, they have the same data to work with. And um, the other thing that's kind of nice about it is uh, if you've got um, if you're using something like RefWorks or EndNote or anything like this, uh, if you're writing your literature review for, say, course credit, and your, uh, your syllabus has asked you to use a particular citation style, say, APA, because you're doing this for an instructor in the School of Public Health, um, then if you later submit it for publication and the editor says, no, we'd like you to use the Harvard format instead, it's very easy to go back into your paper and uh, and use RefWorks or EndNote to just change all of the in-text citations and your reference list, change the formatting, and without you having to go through it line by line, which can be a very tedious process. So uh, final advice I would give would be have someone else proofread your paper. It's always a good idea to get a second set of eyes on um, to check. Uh, just It also helps, um, indeed, in the selection process uh, if you were on a systematic review team, that process of selecting papers to include uh, can often involve uh, at least two investigators who both give a determination whether or not to uh, include something or not. And those where they differ, where they uh, perhaps make a different decision, they involve a third person uh, to adjudicate and determine, yes, you should be looking at this or not. And so um, that helps if you are working on teams. So um, that's my uh, very brief uh, overview. And uh, so at this point, um, I can uh, go back to the um, uh, chat box. And if you have any questions, then uh, feel free to, um, to ask them in the chat box. I see there's one here from uh, Vinika. There's a Prisma form available to download. And yes, in fact, uh, I see that the, uh, the uh, Prisma statement uh, website has been posted on here. So yes, you can go there. Uh, and it is something that uh, is going to be talked about by my colleague Giesler in another presentation in this series. Um, 
this question from Sarah is, will we have access to Himmelfarb full text resources after graduation with the MPH program? Great question. Um, you will not have access to the Himmelfarb library journals and databases um, unless you are physically present in the DC metro area in your job after graduation. So if you get a job with, say, the PCORI Institute on K Street, then you're still very welcome to come in as an alum. And uh, as long as you have an alum G-World card, use our library resources in the library. You can you know, get a, a login to use the computers. Um, and that's true for the other medical libraries in the city as well, like Georgetown or the National Library of Medicine. But you won't have remote access to our electronic resources as an alum, so you won't be able to do it from your own desktop. We just ask you to come in. Are there any other questions? You're welcome. Okay, at, uh, is this presentation available to download? Yes, it uh, will be uh, uploaded to YouTube and uh, made available on the library website, and I shall send a, a link to everybody uh, who was on the uh, um, attendance list. At this point, I shall uh, terminate the recording.